to the uh, the final planet ocean of this of this uh, season. Um, before we start tonight, I thought we'd talk just a little bit about some of the things you might be reading in the newspaper mm -hmm. that relate to budget cuts in universities and, and further budget cuts. Um, pardon me. Can you take a check? <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, just an IOU, I guess. <laughs> yes. Well, I'm. So you know, I'm not sure that um, I'm not sure that that's altogether wise at this point. Mm -hmm. um, in such a short period of time, in such a short time to decision, um, the university has uh, amassed a, a very good response to uh, the potential for something to happen. Uh, but as you see um, your general assemblymen or and women, or you see others associated with the university system, um, you know, stand up for us. Sure. Mm -hmm. um, we think we do a good job uh, for the university and for you all. And, um, you know, we'll, with any luck, see you in the fall. <laughs> <laughs> and I imagine that Melissa has recorded all of this. <laughs> yes? Oh, my goodness. Okay. Just well, um, I'm not going to do the introduction tonight. I'm going to introduce my associate director um, at the Center for Marine Science, Dr. John Morrison. John's a, uh, a physical oceanographer. and. Um, a very good colleague who's helping to put the PhD in coastal marine science through for UNCW this next year. Um, that will be a, an interinstitutional degree with other universities in the state. Um, it is a new road for the university system, and uh, this is at the, uh, the request and the help of the office of the president. So we look forward to uh, actually figuring better things. So uh, without further, John Morrison, please. My pleasure to introduce the speaker tonight. It's a, he's a little bit different in that he actually requested to speak to you guys. Oh, <laughs> no, you invited me. Oh, no, you invited yourself. Oh, yeah, right. <laughs> and he really he wanted to talk to you guys because we, we, as you all know, we all have problems with, with jellyfish here during the summer. So we wanted, to, we wanted to have a timely talk, which is why we're <laughs> scheduled so late. Uh, Robert is a new faculty member here. He, uh, his bachelor's degree at the University of Melbourne, mm -hmm. went on to Virginia Institute of Marine Science for his PhD, went to Bermuda for two years, why he left Bermuda, I'm not quite sure, but he left Bermuda, went to Dolphin Island in Alabama. That's why, that's why I left, <laughs> the oil symbol. And came here, uh, he's, he's been here for about a year, set, establishing himself quite, quite rapidly here. He's one of the members of a large group of, uh, or leaders of, in, the jellyfish world in the marine science. Uh, he's working with a group that also has a uh, library of over 500,000 yep. at this point. Jellyfish from around the world that they use in wow. experimentation. Um, and one of the things he's most proud of, as you saw if you were here at the beginning, when we had some pictures up here, is a group that's called Team. And I'll let him talk to you a little bit about Team. Uh, yeah. it's, it's one of his prides and joys. It's, uh, it's an outreach program to, uh, to uh, students in K-12. So uh, without further ado, Robert Conn. Thanks, John. Can you hear me? Okay. Yeah, good. Uh, thank you for the, uh, the introduction and allowing me to come tonight and talk to you about a topic that's a hot topic basically worldwide and certainly a topic that I'm very interested in. It's uh, central to one of the things that I look at with my research program and that's um, the sort of issues of, of jellyfish blooms and their roles in food webs, impacts on society and, and so on and so forth. So before I sort of get going, I just want to take a, a quick poll. Who here has been stung or has a story about a jellyfish? Not show of hands. Okay. Uh, who here attended Dr. Pauli's talk last fall, where he was talking about uh, the sort of growing crisis with global fisheries? Okay. Um, who here has, a, has an opinion on whether they think jellyfish are increasing worldwide? One person. Okay. I won't ask for your opinion yet, Laura. This is my opinion. Who has read in the media, whether it be local, regional, or one of the big <coughs> um, 
um, newspaper outlets that jellyfish are increasing globally. Yeah, so this there's kind of a mixture there. So this talk is really going to be more about uh, perception, comparing and contrasting scientific communication in terms of what we say, how we perceive things, and are we really following the scientific method? This is something that's worked for centuries, right? All the discoveries like gravity and light followed a, a distinct procedure through time, starting with an observation idea, hypothesis, do the experiment, and the analysis happens lately. So we'll sort of break that down a little bit. But as a means of sort of setting that layer of, of um, perception, I want to take a, a step and look at our, our planet, right? This is what Earth looks like from outer space. It looks like a blue marble. It's a watery planet. We live in a planet that has coverage of about 70% of oceans. And of the actual biosphere, the living biosphere on Earth, it's on the order of 95, 96% is covered and constitutes the oceans, right? So the oceans are very, very important with a lot of things. And they're driving things with, with climate and they're important for our livelihoods. But when it comes to the oceans, we're really focusing, and our knowledge is based on the coastal regions, right? So we really know about 1% of, of that 90-odd percent. So we know very little about the oceans. Yet we do impact the oceans quite a lot. Our human footprint is increasing. So what we are doing here is ultimately affecting what happens in the oceans, which then obviously feeds back to a lot of things. So things like climate change, which we've all heard about, and there have been some other seminars in the series where we're talking about climate change. Well, what is climate change? It's just the study of weather over time, right? That's a very simple definition. There are natural aspects to climate change. There are human-mediated aspects to climate change. It took 25 years for the IPCC to realize that, but they followed the scientific method to get there, right? Climate change is very complex as well. It's not just about CO2, right? There's things like ozone, hydrogen sulfide, methane gases, volatile organics that go between the atmosphere and the oceans. And we don't know much about many of those processes as well. So it's important to make that distinction there right off the bat. Excuse me. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Maybe I'll put the microphone up a little bit. Is that better? Is that better, ma'am? Was it the, uh... Can you hear me okay now? Speak. Yes? Testing? Yes. Okay, radio. So climate change is obviously a big one, and humans are having an impact there as well. And then there's things like overfishing, right? Which is another real process. We are impacting marine food webs out in the ocean, removing fish for our livelihoods, and overfishing is an important practice in most of the, the coastal ocean. And in fact, we as humans are impacting on the order of at least 40 to 50 percent of the oceans through our practices, right? So that's the sort of scene here that we're talking about humans impacting the oceans, and that is setting up the scenario of a so-called degraded ocean. And so the next step that scientists have taken to the public and to the media, and indeed through their publications and their research, is to sort of list some of the, the changes that may occur as a result of changing the natural habitat in the oceans. And one of those sort of symptoms, alleged symptoms of a degraded ocean, are the possible increase of a, a global increase in jellyfish on a worldwide scale. Okay? So you may have seen some of these pictures on, on TV or in a newspaper. So whether it be the, uh, the appearance of these purple mauve stingers that appear in much of the Mediterranean for a lot of the year. Um, that impacts tourism because they sting the, the sea bathers there and they don't want to go there for their for the holiday. So there are socio-economic consequences to jellies. The appearance of these giant jellyfish that I'll refer to a few times tonight that are bigger than um, a, a scuba diver. In this case, that can clog fishing nets, and in fact there have been two cases where uh, Japanese fishing vessels have capsized through the weight of these giant jellyfish. Just, just an amazing impact. But there is a good side to this story as well. 
Um, natural species like moon jellies, who's seen a moon jelly? Yeah, well, they're, they're pretty common throughout the world, but they're an endemic species and they do form large numbers in their natural habitat. So this species here, which it's a, it's a comb jelly, it, it's not in the cnidarians, the stinging varieties that we're familiar with. It's a small non-stinging variety, but it's a voracious predator, it's a lot of plankton, can impact fisheries. And its introduction to the Black Sea um, in, the, in the late 1990s resulted in 97% of the commercial fisheries crashing, basically, within a two-year period. Did you have a question? No. no. I thought I saw the light. So there's this perception that's been built now that jellyfish are indeed increasing on a global scale. Yet there's been no analysis done to date to support that particular perception or paradigm, right? So now we're getting into a conversation between perception and myth versus scientific method itself. Myth is a cultural perception that's passed down from generation to generation, okay? Paradigm itself should be backed up with scientific evidence. And if we don't have enough data and evidence to support something, we should have the courage to say we don't know. But that may not have happened. The bottom line is we have very little information about how and why these blooms form, and even things like what are their roles in marine food webs. You know, they've been here for 500, 550 million years. They, they must have some important and positive role within marine systems. I suspect a lot of fish eat jellyfish as well. So then, what do we really know about jellyfish? Well, it's really restricted to that coastline area, right? That very small part of the oceans around the globe, that's what our knowledge on jellyfish is really based on. And even then, it's not really a lot of knowledge. What about 70% of the other 70% of the Earth? It's, it's, a, it's an open book. Any research that we do on jellies in the open ocean is new to science. And there are just some bizarre and, and amazing forms that are out there. Here's a pelagic snail that's being impacted by uh, oceans, ocean acidification. Here's its little, little shell here. But you have these sort of libations, which are just, a, just an amazing um, but really important um, group that's out there and prevalent in the, in the open ocean. We just don't know enough about them at this particular stage. So we know very little other than there are a lot of important groups out there that are unknown to science um, and these need to be researched more and um, more discoveries made about them. I want to show you a, a quick video to sort of introduce you to some more of the diverse kinds of jellies that are, that are out there and to sort of give you the example of one of the, the giant jellies in, in Japan. This is a, a video that was put together by a colleague out in California, Blue Ocean Productions, Jim Knowlton is his name. He's worked a lot with um, the Custodes with their documentaries here. And um, in this video, we just want to sort of show the different kinds of jellies that are out there and, and you know, demonstrate their importance to marine systems. This is an important one for medical research. The green fluorescent proteins that has advanced medical research to um, great scales came from that particular jellyfish back there. This is a deep sea siphonophore. This is comb jelly here. These are hermaphrodites, so you need one to form a bloom. They produce male and female gametes. Um, really delicate animals. You touch them, we could routinely go blue water diving in the middle of the ocean. You touch them, they just fall apart. So it's a challenge to study these animals as well. <coughs> Box jellies, um, invasive kinds. That past jelly there had a little crab living in there. So these are actual ecosystems in themselves. If you look at a jellyfish, you find lots of little juvenile fish living in amongst the tentacles or little crabs that are harboring, uh, living in amongst them. There's actually a little musical soundtrack here that goes along with it, but <laughs> anyway. You can see that they tend to degrade also, so wave action can break them apart, but they're still able to reproduce and form blooms that way. This is a self. This is actually a relative of us. It's, it belongs in the phylum chordata. We don't look like that, obviously. You can see some of these fish that are living here, and another little 
tin form floating by. This is a rare um, jelly that appears every seven to ten years in, in the Gulf of Mexico. It comes from deep water up into the surface waters. This is, uh, I forget what type of fish this is, but it's a commercially harvested fish, so it might be important for recruitment of fishery stocks in subsequent years. A lot of deep sea varieties actually bioluminesce as well. Um, obviously the deep sea is very dark, and uh, scientists think that it might be a way of communicating between different different animals, maybe even attracting a mate to, to reproduce. Okay, so this is the one I, that's received a lot of press, particularly over the last five, six years. This is the example in the Sea of Japan with these giant jellyfish. And what you're looking at here is footage of these giant jellyfish caught in these nets here. Um, again, these weigh about, there it is, 100 kilograms each, so 220 pounds each. Um, and so they're, they're big animals, and they're, they're having a big impact. Obviously, they're very heavy, and these nets obviously get damaged as well. It costs about a million yen to repair the nets. You can see, you can see these fish. The fish are dead as well, and the fish that are actually caught in the nets are useless too because they've been scarred and they've got all the jelly tissue in there too. So it's a huge economic loss. Well, the flip side to this now is that obviously fisheries in some areas have taken a big hit. But what happens now is they're turning it into an ecotourism. And it's a multi-million dollar business in Japan where you can actually go and swim with a giant jellyfish. It's amazing. They're making more money out of that than they were with the fisheries. Oh, yes, they steam. Yes. Oh, my word, yes. <laughs> Okay. Alright, so with this talk, there are a couple of things I want to achieve and, and to get across to you. First, I want to, I want to break down this paradigm of a global increase in jellyfish. Right? Now, I'm using this collective term jellyfish. Right? So what is a jellyfish? And in fact, we have these discussions with my colleagues and we've spent days talking about what is a jellyfish. If you want boredom, go to one of these discussions. <laughs> okay. All right, so we have stinging varieties that are the medusae, tinafores, which are comb jellies, and then there's also these selps. Remember, these are the ones that are related to us, the pelagic tunicates. So for the most part, for this talk, I'm going to put them all under the one umbrella and call them jellyfish. Okay, so we're going to talk about that, and then um, I'm going to talk about a global analysis that we did to look at the trends in jellyfish worldwide and then explore some of the uh, possible environmental drivers that could be both natural or human mediated. Alright, so naturally jellyfish blooms have captured the imagination of, of the media and the public. Um, and this also happens with kids, right? They see jellyfish on things like Spongebob, so they're more aware about this <coughs> as well. But um, the public, I get pegged for media interviews all the time. In fact, I had two today. Um, what's shown here is a figure we put together showing the number of scientific reports versus the number of media reports on jellyfish broken up into decadal increments. So starting in 1940, and up until the end of the, the most recent decade, 20, 2010. Okay? And so what you can see here is that, obviously for the last two decades, and the last decade, the most recent in particular, there is a big increase in scientific reports, and also in the number of media reports. But I want you to notice here the numbers. Here's 1,500 scientific reports, actually a tick under. Media reports is 15,000. So there's at least... 10 media reports, and this number is actually should be closer to 20 to 25,000. So we're talking about 10 to 15 media reports for every one science report. And it's not necessarily about a jellyfish bloom, it could be about medical research, which is not directly related to the ecology of the animal. So the question then is, is the media driving public perception, or is this truly a global phenomenon? So we're going to explore that a little bit, bit more. And so where did this overall paradigm of a global rise in jellyfish and its link to a degraded ocean start? Well, it started with this paper that appeared in the journal Science back in 2001. You might be familiar with it. It's called Historical Overfishing 
and the recent collapse of coastal ecosystems. Uh, Jeremy Jackson, and there were about 26 other authors on this. And very late in the paper, there's a little paragraph, and it says, temperate estuaries, so we're just talking about estuaries, worldwide, are undergoing profound changes in oceanography, blah, 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 due to human exploitation, pollution, rendering them the most degraded marine ecosystems. The litany of changes includes increase, they talk about harmful algal blooms, dead zones, so on and so forth, outbreaks of jellyfish. That's the only time it appears in, in the paper. Okay? It's called the rise of slime hypothesis. Right, anyone's picked up a jelly, it's very slimy. So it's a catchy soundbite that the media grab onto immediately. Again, it's published in Science, so it's, a, it's the highest journal in the world. So it gets global exposure straight away. And it's cited a huge amount of times. Right? At least 3,000 times it's been cited uh, since 2001. So what is that? That's, um, I can't do the math in my head, bro, on the top of that, but it's a lot compared to other, other journals and, and publications. I don't have a problem with this statement if the scientific method is followed. You go back and actually look at the references, that's where it starts to fall down. The reference is from a paper, actually a book chapter on oysters, right? So it's not even about jellyfish, it's about oysters, it's about Chesapeake Bay. So it's not even worldwide. Right? So, we know this game we play at school called the broken telephone. I whisper a mes message here, we're talking about cats and dogs. By the time we get up to Dr. Freshwater, we're talking about elephants and cheetahs. <laughs> right? And for the most part, we believe that this is a, a case for the jellyfish perception and paradigm all throughout the literature since when the paradigm actually started to form, which was sort of in the late 1990s and, and early 2000s. Just to sort of paint an example here, here's a recent paper from 2011. I removed the author's name. It's not mine. Um, in addition, it's currently argued that jellyfish populations are increasing in a variety of coastal regions worldwide. Previous reports, such bodies as the Black Sea, yes, that's, that's true. There was a, that comb jelly that was introduced that had a big impact. There was another comb jelly that was introduced that eats that other cone jelly. And so the population's crashed back down to baseline levels again. Failed to mention it. Bering Sea, we'll explore this example in a minute. And the Northern Gulf of Mexico. All right, here's the data from the Northern Gulf of Mexico. 1985 to present, more or less. Okay, this data is freely available, downloaded from the internet. You can go to the, uh, the CMAP website. So everyone here can do it. Here it is. Up, down, up, down, up, down. Looks very cyclical, no? Certainly, you can't draw a line through there to say there's been an increase. Let's take Chesapeake Bay. This is what the Jackson paper was referring to. We have an even better record from Chesapeake Bay. It's the most studied and well-known estuary in the world. So here we have 1950 up until present. Again, up, down, up, down, up, down. And when you do the statistics on it, no significant increase. Again, the data is freely available. In fact, what we've done now is we've gone back and we've analysed every single scientific paper on jellyfish research and ecology for the past 15 years. We've gone back and seen who said what, who did they reference, go back to that <coughs> reference to see what they actually say. And it's on the order of 50 to 60 percent of the papers are incorrectly citing the trend in global jellyfish. Myself included, I will own up and confess. <laughs> so we're, we're trying to put that together in a very tactful way because it's going to be controversial, but it's important to make that message. So what can we do about this? Right? Clearly we have a paradigm that's based on myth perception and no data at all. I headed up a project, uh, it started about four years ago. Uh, we formed a, a global jellyfish working group based at uh, a synthesis center in Santa Barbara, UC Santa Barbara, called the National Center for Ecological Analysis and Synthesis. Ironically, this same place funded the Jackson research <laughs> 10 years previous. There's another story there we won't go to. <coughs> anyway, we, I headed up this group, um, and we basically called in experts, uh, not only within the jellyfish field, but 
in all a variety of disciplines. So we had socioeconomics, so socioeconomists come in, we had people that were broadly oceanographers, climate change researchers. We brought all this interdisciplinary expertise into a room and sort of hashed out the issues that were put before us. You can see some people here that might be familiar to, to some. And that's uh, still an ongoing effort, even though the, the project's finished on paper. Um, it's also had its times. Challenging moments, but they're the things that make life great, right? Mm -hmm. And so what were the objectives of this global jellyfish group? Well, we had several. We were looking at the effects of jellyfish on on carbon cycles and, and food webs, consequences for ecosystem services. This could be tourism, fishing, so on and so forth. Um, we thought it was important to write the ship. So we wanted to communicate to the media and to the public at large of the project results. Right. So we had several outreach events, one in Spain, in Madrid, where it was very multilingual, um, and we had uh, press conferences and things like that. And uh, we uh, also constructed a, a global jellyfish database that I'll show you a little bit later on. This is going to be an open a access database that everyone here can, can look into. But the main <coughs> objective of the group was to look at this hypothesis of a potential global expansion of jellyfish blooms and to look at some of the possible drivers. One of the first papers we put out as a group was, was this paper here, uh, published in Bioscience in early 2012, with the title, Questioning the Rise of Gelatinous Zooplankton, fancy name for jellyfish, in the world's oceans. And here are most of the group members here. This paper did not go down well. Particularly the title here, Question the Rights. People took umbrage at that. And this actually upset a lot of our colleagues. There was a rebuttal sent to nature, um, basically laying out the same arguments, the degraded ocean, so and so forth. Yet when we approached those people to say, produce the data, they were very reluctant to do so. Mm -hmm. Anyway, the point was, in this paper here, we weren't actually saying whether things were increasing or decreasing, which was what the perception was in most of the media. What we were saying is, look, hang on, we need to take a step back here and see what data are there to put forth and to support this current perception. And do we need to, to shift things slightly? And so the other thing we did was to lay out basically a blueprint for the future. This is the problem. This is what we know. This is the current status. This is the way that we propose to go forward. It seems simple enough, but it caused so much problems. It's probably why I'm... <laughs> So three points I want to highlight to consider, and again, this may not be just isolated to jellyfish, but I am going to focus, sort of focus on jellyfish because it's a jellyfish talk. <laughs> so, why is a jellyfish blue versus seasonal population? Right, there are some things to consider here. What is the evidence for historical frequency of jellyfish blooms? Is this a recent thing, or has this happened all throughout time? What are the proper space and time scales? to evaluate jellyfish blooms, right? Take the climate example, 25 years to definit definitively answer the question that humans are impacting climate on Earth, right? It took 25 years, they followed the scientific method, but that was the appropriate time scale to make that conclusion. So we should follow what's worked for centuries. So how do we, find, how do we define a jellyfish bloom? Well, up until recently, this is how it was defined. Abnormal or normal seasonal increase in jellyfish that is caused by environmental variables or human activities. It doesn't get any woolier than that. That's, that's pretty broad. It encompasses both natural and human aspects. Abnormal, normal, it's very vague. Mm. And the important thing here is that it's open to misinterpretation really, really easily. Mm. The example I give is that this is not a bloom. Right. So here's a picture of a box jellyfish taken uh, by a friend of mine just before she was stung. <laughs> Actually, I, I believe a former student here at UNCW, now down at Dolphin Island. Uh, and you can see here that these box jellies actually like to live over <coughs> sandy areas. Now, box jellies, who's heard of box jellies and the, the effects they can have? Voracious things, really. Um, strong stingers, and they hurt quite a lot. We have some species, endemic species here. The case in um, Australia is 
that there's a species there that can kill you within three minutes. Oh. So they're really important um, organisms for not only the food webs, but for the economy as well, because that impacts tourism. Well, you get one animal, stings a tourist, media picks up on it, deadly jellyfish in bay. It's not even a deadly jellyfish, this kind's not even deadly. But they shut down tens of thousands of kilometers just, just to investigate this. So here's a clear example where the definition can be misinterpreted. Particularly of a balloon. So what I'm suggesting is that we need to remove the human element to the definition, right? What's plotted here are years with jellyfish problems from the 20s up until present. And you can see a big increase in the years with jellyfish problems for the 2000s, for the decade in the, in the early 2000s, okay? And this would be problems with fisheries, stings, which impacts tourism, and then power stations where the the intake pipes are clogged with huge amounts of, of jellyfish and they have to shut it down. It's a multi-million dollar problem. So the other definition is qualitative. And what we're suggesting is that we need to define jellyfish blooms quantitatively and according to the scientific method. And so what happens is, is that really what we should be focusing in is the numbers those outliers, those extreme numbers. So if jellyfish blooms are in fact increasing, we should be looking for those really extreme events. And they should be increasing over time. We'll get back to that point a little bit later on. Really, the need for this is apparent because we as humans are increasing our interaction with the oceans. And we're increasing at, a, at, a human, at, an, ex, at an exponential rate. And that's going to continue for the foreseeable future. So we really need to remove that human element and just stick to the scientific method. Alright, so that's the issue with blues. What about the historical baseline? So what's shown here is a sort of a conceptual timeline over geological, sort of biblical, historical and sort of modern timelines. And what's shown here along this timeline are examples of when jellyfish blooms have been recorded over those particular time scales. So you can see here the the ancient Minoans in Crete used to paint jellyfish blooms on their pottery, and still do. Um, they're not ancient now, of course, but <laughs> the, the pottery from um, the, Ion the Ionian area is, has a lot of jellyfish. This is an octopus, you can see jellyfish here. Many of the early uh, voyages documented swarms of jellyfish. The Challenger reports, Captain Cook's log had swarms of jellyfish in, um, in Port Jackson back in the, the late 1700s. So we know that they were present back then. Um, the other thing with, with media as well, there are examples of the same thing being said. For instance, hordes of moon jellyfish found in Monterey Bay, never seen here before. So that was a, a recent quote from a local. You go back to the same paper, it was the LA Times, 1930, the same quote. <laughs> so you know, it's an issue there of a collective memory, right? So when we start asking people, have jellyfish increased? Well, I have trouble thinking about what I did this morning. Yeah. That's why my PhD student tells me all the time, you did this. <laughs> so then you look at things like beach strandings, okay? This was uh, a beach stranding in San Francisco back in late 2010, uh, two days before we had an outreach event. So it was good timing. But when we start seeing this sort of fossil excavation site, you can see how something like this, which is a bloom, occurred back 500 million years ago. So clearly this is not just a recent phenomenon. This is something that has happened over time, since their evolution 500, 550 million years ago. So it tells us one thing, it tells us qualitatively that blooms were present, but what it doesn't tell us is the quantity. And that's what's really important in, in interpreting trends. All right, so let's move on to the space and time scales. And this is one of the smoking gun regions that are typically used to, as an example of an increase in jellyfish on the global scale. The Bering Sea, obviously very important for US commerce. It's a lot of fishery dollars come from there. And it's also an area where there are many endemic species of jellyfish. The one shown here is that the Arctic sea nettle, Chrysera melanaster. And what I want you to focus on here is the, the black line. This is a 
sort of a timeline of the biomass index in 1,000 metric tons of this particular species across this entire area here. So from 1975 to 1990, relatively low levels of this sea nettle. Then the 90s came. Up it went, right? So just enormous amounts of, of these jellyfish, 350,000 metric tons caught in a, in a fishing season is obviously a lot of jellyfish. Gets a lot of interest, and scientists publish this paper in sort of a lower profile journal, a very reputable one, but lower profile, um, with the title, Increases in Jellyfish Biomass in the Bering Sea, Implications for the Ecosystem. And they started saying, well, it's overfishing and climate change that are causing this increase. That's fine with that. They followed the scientific method. The problem was, as soon as that paper was released, bang, back the jellyfish went down to the, to the background levels. <laughs> to their credit, they published another paper in Progress in Oceanography entitled The Rise and Fall of Jellyfish in the Eastern Barrier Sea in relation to climate regime shifts, and they show some comparisons with climate indices and so on and so forth. Going back to that broken telephone example, the problem is, is that no one ever quotes this. They always quote the previous paper that actually is talking about an increase. And so, again, that then perpetuates the wrong message. This is the paper they should be quoting, because it shows the appropriate time scale and trend, yet everyone just talks about the increase, because that's what the journals are accepting these days. All right, so what does that tell us? Well, first you should quote the appropriate reference, right, to back up the paradigm with data. And you also need to analyze an appropriate time scales, right? So if this is what jellyfish are doing, right, they're rising and falling, say, over a 20 to 30 year period, yet this is your sampling effort. We go out over a four year period, we're really opening ourselves up to what's called aliasing the data. We're going to correctly interpret the trend over that four-year period, yet what we really need to know is the full 30 years to analyze that data. Right? That's a challenge for the community because we are typically funded over four, maybe five years if we're lucky. So getting funding for a 30-year period is very, very difficult. Dr. Baden mentioned at the start here about the budgets. So this number is getting smaller. Yet we need to know this. So that is a challenge for the community, and we're always looking for ways to try and get over that. All right, so there's sort of the, the problems there. So what did we do about it with our group? Well, we did a, the first global analysis to assess the paradigm of jellyfish increasing globally. Right. Remember, up until that point, no one had actually done this following the scientific method. We had our hypothesis. This is a null hypothesis. We're saying that jellyfish population sizes and the number of blooms have not significantly increased. So we're following the process. This map here shows some of the, the, the data sets that we actually used in our analyses. Red dots mean that there was an, a, um, an increase in that data set, that time series. Blue is a decrease, and the gray dots here show no change over time. So you can see there's a lot of dots here, even in the southern hemisphere, where there's no change over time. Immediately you can see that. We focus on those data sets that were 10 years or greater, right? We didn't want to get caught into the Bering Sea trap. Also, we had some problems with comparing apples and oranges, right? Jim goes out and measures jellyfish one way, someone else does it a different way. So we needed to standardize that data, and I won't go into the methods, but we basically remove the units from the numbers to create a jellyfish index. That way we could compare the different units that way. All right, so here's my standard spiel that I tell the media. You're going to make them happy as well. Clearly there are areas where jellyfish have increased. The Sea of Japan is one area that has exhibited a significant increase. So again, here's this big jelly. Here's the timeline. So 1920 up until present, you can see previously not many jellyfish blooms recorded. More recently, they're appearing more or less every year. So this is an area where there has been, obviously, an increase. Having said that, the last year and a half, they've been non-existent in the Sea of Japan. <laughs> so now the case is being made, well, is this like the Bering Sea? Is it just a case of rise and fall? 
and there's quality of this information previously here good enough to make any scientific conclusion to trends of this jellyfish? Um, I'm not even going there. I usually defer that question to my colleague in Japan, and he's very diplomatic. He's good at answering those questions. What about the rest of the world? Right? We've actually improved the time series now. We have about 50 different areas around the world. A lot of people have donated generously their unpublished data sets, so we're able to improve the trends. So what's shown here are all different regions. Again, red is increased, blue is a decrease, and black, in this case, is no change over time. Here's Gulf of Mexico, uh, Chesapeake Bay here, right? Up, down, up, down. Eastern Bering Sea, right? More recently, we've added some more data. There's an increase, but again, it's starting to decrease again. Um, here, here is the South Atlantic bite. Here it is. Again, no change in jellyfish over time. Up, down, up, down. Right? So clearly there are areas where there's an increase, a decrease, but for the most part, there seems to be a lot of periodicity to this data. So what does it look like on a global scale when we put all of this together? So we took this data and we take an average number of jellyfish per year. And this is what we get. So we have up here just the jellyfish index over time, 1940 to 2011. Up the top here we have, uh, that's the top, the bottom here is the, the percent of jellyfish blooms, right? Remember, they're those extreme data points. And if jellyfish blooms are increasing, then we should see a sustained increase. So what do we see here? I show this to my third grade students. Um, I'll show you this in a, in a minute. Well, we see rise, fall, rise, fall. Yeah. What are the blooms doing? Rise, fall, rise, fall. And they're also in concert with the sort of average numbers on, on a global scale. So actually, no increase in jellyfish, at least on a, on a global scale. And there appears to be some cyclical nature to the data on the order of 18 to 20 years. Actually, it's 22 years. You'll see, see in a minute. This is an important result. And it's been a hard sell to give to our colleagues. Right? They, a lot of them don't believe what we're, what we're saying. They want to continue to perpetuate an increase in jellyfish. Um, it's almost though at the point where looking at the number of blooms doesn't really matter. Because we know, based on these trends, and that these trends continue, that there's going to be increasing rising phases in, in the cycle. And so we as humans need to be prepared to cope and adapt to those particular situations. So that's all the jellyfish put together, right? What about the different groups, right? So here we go. Here's Medusae, here are the cone jellies, and here are these selps, our relatives. Well, this is very <coughs> interesting because here you have tenophores, again, showing this cycling nature, selps showing this cycling nature, but it's on 11 years. The Medusae are cycling on 22 years. So this clearly is what's driving the global trend. And this is clearly what we have the most information for and about. So what could be causing these cycles that are just going around a stationary baseline? Well, let's examine the list of candidates in terms of what has been used previously to say and put a case forward for an increase in jellyfish on a global scale or a local scale. Here they are. Overfishing, climate change, temperature, which is related there. Many of these are related to each other. Eutrophication, so you add more nutrients, more phytoplankton, more food for the jellyfish. Hypoxia, jellyfish can tolerate low oxygen. Uh, introductions, yes. Pollution, so on and so forth. Well, um, I'm going to highlight these two here in a minute. Artificial substrate and just natural processes. And there are many more that we can add to here. I think the answer is it's likely synergistic. So many of these drivers are probably playing a part with, with one another. But again, none of these are substantiated with any type of analyses or data. So if you read in the media that it's due to overfishing or it's due to climate change, I would immediately question that and say, well, where are the data to, su 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 <coughs> excuse me, to support it? They're just not there at, at this particular change. Anyway, 
So where are we heading with this research? So I'll highlight here my um, PhD student, Maura. You can put your hand up. She's going to be looking at this. So the key next step here to really make a convincing case for the jelly cycles is what are the mechanisms causing this? This is happening on a global scale. So it's something we believe that is also occurring environmentally on a global scale. And where we're focusing our attention, in, at least in the short term, is the sun. The sun is very, very important for everything on Earth, right? First of all, the physics is the most important thing. The biology and the chemistry is just reacting to the physics. And this is the biggest physical driver on Earth. It sustains life. And there are things, a lot of things that can happen on the sun that can influence the biology on Earth. Things like sunspots that can increase the amount of light in UV and, and heat that reaches Earth. Okay, you get these dark spots and it flares up around the edge. These happen on a regular basis on, on the sun. And in fact, when you start plotting sunspot numbers against the Medusae, look at this, a beautiful negative correlation. You cannot fabricate data like this. So we're now trying to tease apart sunspot and things like UV and heat that can actually cause changes on the global ocean to try and figure out what could be causing uh, decadal changes in, in the Medusae. So a lot of focus has been here with the stinging varieties that we're very familiar with. This is just one part of the, of the life cycle of, of a jellyfish. There's also, how many people here knew that there was a benthic small polyp face to a, other than Dr. Bateman, <laughs> you're, you're out of the equation. Anyone here heard or read about small baby polyps that are about this big? We have a microscope over there with some live polyps there. Okay, that's good. Yeah. We know very, very little about this phase of the life cycle. But it's what is happening here in the bottom of the ocean on hard substrate. That's what's really controlling the number of, of medusae that we see on a seasonal basis. Basically what happens, you have male and female jellyfish. They sexually reproduce. A small larva forms, settles on hard substrate, typically oyster shells or rock or something like that. They overwinter, temperature increases in the spring, these polyps start to produce baby jellyfish that bud off asexually, grow rapidly within one to two weeks, you're in for a big jellyfish. Right? So what are we doing as humans on the bottom of our ocean? Not much. So here we have polyps living on hard substrate we're also increasing potentially the amount of hard substrate that these polyps could be living on, right? So I'll highlight something like aquaculture farms. On a global scale, aquaculture farms are increasing at a rate of 7.5% per year. Right? Things like oysters, clams, so on and so forth. In the Mediterranean, hanging in the water column, out of the dead zone at the bottom, this is potential increased habitat for jellyfish polyps to settle and therefore feed back into blooms. Um, oil rigs in the Gulf of Mexico. There's enough surface area on oil rigs in the Gulf to build a bridge from Florida to Texas right across. <laughs> Amazing statistic. Here, um, riprap, and you want to you know, lose your property into the ocean, so you put riprap there, the rocks. That's all substrate for polyps and other invasives to, to live there. So this is another possibility here that's a human-mediated result and the issue now is to sort of look at different types of artificial substrate and how does that relate to these jelly cycles is that does it superimpose and accentuate trends and cause a baseline shift these are all important questions yeah wind farms is just artificial substrate so you have the the hard sort of where is it here yeah, so actually colleagues in Norway, Nor the Norwegians have a lot of wind farms, and uh, they've found a lot of jellyfish polyps living just underneath the surface on the, on the columns that are holding up the blades. Yeah, good question. That's an issue here locally, right? Wind farms are a big thing off North Carolina. 
So what can we do about it? Yeah, well, we can do a lot of things. We can do more research to understand the trends and, and so on and so forth. Well, I think there are a lot more important things that we could be doing. One of the things that we did with our global jellyfish group is form this database called the Jellyfish Database Initiative, or JEDI for short. Um, all right. My wife, second floor, she's still kind of to blame for that. She came up with that acronym. But, um, and the media's had a field day with it as well. But this is an open access tool. Anyone can, can well, we're working out some computer glitches. But hopefully in a, in a week or so, you're going to be able to log into uh, my web page here at UNCW. Bang, you can access the, the Jellyfish database. It's also been designed as a future repository of data sets. So we're going to continually monitor the baseline and um, be able to assess the issue with jellyfish blooms constantly, 20, 30, 40 years from now. Half a million data points, um, and we can do better than this. But it's a good way for, for you all to get involved into the research itself. Mm. One of the ways that we're um, using the, the JEDI in our research is a paper that just sort of come out, and um, some of you may have read about this in the, in the media, where we've actually used the information there to come up with an estimate of jellyfish biomass in the oceans. This is not the cycles per se, this is just how much jellyfish biomass is there. And it's been a surprising result. We have here in the South Atlantic Bight high jellyfish biomass, right? We know this already. But there's equal biomass out here in the middle of the ocean. So to me this suggests that jellyfish aren't a symptom of a degraded ocean, but perhaps they're a symptom of a healthy ocean. To some, regards, to, to some respects. The, um, the other website that I'll um, bring to your attention is this jellywatch.org. Uh, Anyone seen this? A friend of mine, Steve Haddock, at Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute, runs this. It's, um, he's won a lot of awards. Basically, there are some apps here as well, iPhone and Android apps, downloaded for free. You can go to the beach, you see a jellyfish, you take a picture, um, all the information in terms of how many there are, you enter in there. Um, Latin long is already recorded by your phone. It goes into a database, which in turn goes into JEDI. So we actually use that in our research. So it's a really nice way to get, get involved as well. Um, it's important to teach this at undergrade levels and graduate levels, but I think it's also equally important to teach this at an elementary level as well. There's statistics that show that if you can capture the imagination of a young child, six to eight year old, and you nurture that interest in a particular discipline over time, they're 90% more likely to take it on as a career in the future. And I think that we, can, we as scientists can actually do a lot better at this particular level. And so using that motivation, I established this, uh, this program called TEAMS, Towards Elementary Advancement in Marine Science. And there are really three objectives to it. Teach the process of science, which I think is the fundamental aspect of all science that we do. Involve the students in research, right? This is not just going in and doing a little experiment. These are results from a second grade class down in Alabama. And many of these kids hadn't even seen the ocean. And they live five miles from the beach. Mm -hmm. And here they're producing some beautiful results on phytoplankton growth, looking at light and nutrients and how that feeds into marine food webs and issues like climate change. Um, we also go on research cruises into the middle of the ocean and we can just tap our computer in, use Skype and then beam live into the classroom. So they get that real-time interactive experience. Um, we can even walk around the ship with our iPad to show people doing work. It's just, just amazing. <laughs> The other thing is that we can help teachers develop marine science curriculum. So now we're not just talking about jellyfish, we're talking about issues on a wider scale. So there are some, some points um, that I think that are very important in moving forward, not only with jellyfish, but, but many aspects. So I'll leave you with this question here. What will we end up with? Are we going to have an ocean full of fish um, that are perceived as being healthy? Or are we going to have an ocean that's full of jellyfish and nasty things like bacteria and stuff? Actually, that, nothing could be further than the truth. Microbes are great. <laughs> I, I research them as well. Um, but I think that 
obviously we're having an impact on the oceans in general, and we really are at a point where we need to make the changes in our activities. And so these things, like what will we end up, needs, the decisions need to be made now. So um, I'll leave you with that thought, and uh, happy to entertain any questions that you might have. So thank you very much for, for listening to me. All right. that we're feeding to the report, right? And I think that historically, uh, and in many cases, I've done it myself, so I can speak from experience, that very quick to give a sound bite, a quick, a quick answer, yes, they're increasing, done. That's all they're interested in hearing. And so I think we just need to have the courage now to say, I don't know, that's an incorrect statement, please don't quote me on that, so on and so forth. Um, that's one way of looking at that. Having said that, this paper that just came out has gathered a lot of media interest around the world, the, Je the Jedi in particular, and we don't say anything about global trends in jellyfish. We're just saying there's X amount of jellyfish in the oceans, yet newspapers like The Guardian and The Daily Mail mm -hmm. in, in Europe are having a field day. They're saying that jellyfish are increasing and that holy... Um, Holiday makers should check Jedi to make sure that there are no jellyfish in the area. So there are both sides to it. Yes, there are real mistakes being made in terms of the communication. And yes, there's that sensationalism with, with the media. The attention span of a human is two minutes. Two minutes these days. It used to be much longer. That's why things like Twitter are so popular. 140 characters. I use it all the time for my science work and communication. And that's a challenge to get this issue yeah. down into 140 characters. And I can show you an example in nature where someone within my group made a big boo-boo, exactly what you're saying, where they're saying, well, here are the issues with jellyfish blooms. You know, they could be increasing, blah, blah, blah. The conclusion was that the oceans are degraded and jellyfish are increasing. So we need to be very careful with that. Yes, yes, ma'am. Why do you think, or how would you speculate, why your colleagues are resistant to accepting your research? Uh, that's an easy one. They think that we're downgrading the importance of the discipline itself. And I believe nothing can be further than the truth. They, they believe that if we're not making it sensational and saying that they're increasing, then we're not going to get funding, basically. Okay, so yeah. it all boils down to money. Yeah. Again, I'll always say that the, the whole issue of whether they're increasing or not, I don't think really matters. We know that they're going to go through rising and falling periods. We just need to be focusing and be prepared for the next rising phase, which we're about to hit. I'm not real clear on the uh, the uh, No, it's a very good question. It's at the heart of the whole issue of overfishing causing an increase in, in jellies. There are many, many fish that eat jellies that we know of. Spadefish is a good example um, where they eat, eat jellies. Leather jackets, things like that. Uh, mackerel are known to eat, eat jellies as well. So there's that natural aspect. Jellies, particularly that comb jelly, voracious predators on fish eggs, fish larvae, even juvenile fish themselves, some of these big stinging varieties. So there's that connection there as well. Now, we as humans, this is why I started with that sort of climate change 
overfishing being a real thing. Overfishing is a real is a real thing. Um, we're removing a lot of fish for our use. Actually, 16, it's only 16 percent of protein consumption in humans comes from fish in the sea. The, other, the rest comes from land processes, chickens, cows, and so on and so forth. So, but we're still removing a lot of fish from the oceans. What is the effect of that on the overall food web? And this is where this, these arguments, these are serious arguments that are, that are had. Is it a top-down effect? Is it something that's happening at the base of the food web with phytoplankton changing that's causing an increase in jellyfish, at least in a, in a local area? And things like the cycles themselves and what's causing, what are the mechanisms to those cycles are unknown as well. How is that going to impact the rest of the food web as, as well? Yeah. 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 Yeah, but then, but then you're removing a food source from the ocean, a potentially important food source. Ah. Okay. Now, I, now I see what you're saying. Okay. Okay. So it's it's. It's interesting you say that because Laura and I were just sitting down this afternoon looking, looking at that. Up until, no, I'm not going to say anything because it's it's very really preliminary evidence. But there are some correlations up to a certain point, you know, 1975, 1980 period, and then trends sort of fall apart. So then you ask questions. Well, is that due to the fact that we've just overfished the oceans at that point, and it doesn't really matter what happens? Yeah.